We're back with FSH in our continuing series of hormones. I love Yay. this. Um, FSH is such, oh, I feel like it's a big mystery. Women have no idea what level they're supposed to be if they're fertile. So let's start from the top, Dr. Raquel. Yes. What FSH, what is it for? Yes. So FSH is very important and it's another hormone that's released, released by your pituitary gland. Um, and FSH is actually the hormone that's released by your brain to tell your ovaries to release an egg. Um, so it is very important. And it's an, um, it's why they test you on day three is because it goes right along with estrogen as some of those indicators of ovarian function. Got it. So in this symphony, as you've been calling it, right, that happens with all of our hormones together, yeah. um, when does FSH get out of whack? And, and is it something that if it's, is it the kind of hormone that can get out of whack and then that could be fixable? Or is it, you, you know, indicative of perimenopause and menopause? Yes, that's such a good question. So um, like she just said, FSH and estrogen, they work like in this complex symphony, right? And so what your brain does is it's like, okay, it's the beginning of the month, it's the beginning of your cycle, we're starting um, a new menstrual cycle. So what it does is it releases your brain or your pituitary gland releases this FSH, and then this tells your um, ovary to release that egg. What that egg does is release estrogen. So they work together. But what should happen is that when your egg releases that estrogen, those numbers go up. But now, since that estrogen is going up, now your reproductive system is like, okay, FSH can come back down. So that's why on day three, they want your FSH to be below 10 and your estrogen to be between 25 and 75. So it's like, okay, we're Got releasing it. estrogen, the FSH can go down. Now in women who are in perimenopause or who have premature ovarian failure, their FSH will be above 10 on day three. That tells the doctor that, uh-oh, your brain is desperate to get an egg out. And that's why your FSH levels are so high. Let me make sure I understand this, is that even, so let's say you have an 11 or a 12, it's not indicative that you have no eggs that are gonna ovulate. It's simply more indicative that you're heading towards that perimenopausal state, heading towards that menopause. So your pituitary gland is, is uh, kind of slowing down, if you will, or just not, not producing as much but that's not the indicator that there's no eggs to stimulate. Right, it's not an indicator that there's no eggs to stimulate, but what it tells doctors, if you go in, sometimes it might be 11 or 12, and I know certain doctors will say, oh, well, you know, we can still kind of work with that, but let's just say it's 20 or 30, and it's day right. three of your cycle, then that right. tells the doctor, your brain is working really, really hard mm -hmm. to push out an egg, and so that's why your FSH is so, is so high. Okay. And this might be kind of out of your domain of naturopathic fertility care, but is there an FSH level that is 100% that's a diagnostic of menopause and there's no eggs to, to even attempt a stimulation cycle of? So what uh, most doctors normally do is they, well, fertility doctors, and I always have to say in this, because if you go to right. the OBGYN, they're, they're probably not going to say like, oh, your FSH is above 10 you know, you should go up see a facility doctor because they tend to really make sure they stay in their sphere. Um, Got it. But if you go to a fertility doctor, that's when they are very critical of that number being below 10. So I don't know the cutoff per se, um, but okay. I do know that if, if you come in and let's say a lot of our patients are 50 um, mm -hmm. and they get those day three labs done, it is, um, you know, it's, it's pretty normal for your FSH to be like in the 30 or 40 range. Um, Got but it. for the sake of fertility, you do want to keep it below 10. Okay, got it. And, yeah. it. and it is about that ratio too, right? It's not just about the standalone number mm -hmm. um, as you're talking about, like it does matter FSH as it relates to your estradiol so that those two numbers have to work in relation with each other. That's that whole part of the symphony. Absolutely. And that's why I know even like in Low our office, FSH, higher estrogen, that's exactly. the ratio, right? That's the ratio. Okay. And okay. you'll see a lot of doctors even clump it together. So when you go get your blood work, work done, they put E2 slash FSH. Is because they're working together. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, are there, so the pituitary gland itself, I mean, it's responsible for so many things. Are there disorders or things associated with the pituitary gland itself that can be treated um, or course corrected that could kind of almost artificially throw off those numbers? Yeah. So you could have like hyper or hypo pituitaryism. Um, that could affect the way your body either produces too many hormones or not enough. A very, very common symptom that I see even before I got to um, the Center for Reproductive Health and Gynecology when I was still in school on rotations, something that a lot of women do not notice is that they might have a prolactinoma 
Um, and that also influences your fertility like big time because if you have too much prolactin, which is also from pituitary gland, okay. um, it literally can make you infertile. Um, wow. so it's, and that's a, a major disorder of the pituitary gland that a lot of women totally don't even know about. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And would that diagnosis come from just checking the prolactin levels? Yep. And some, and some fertility doctors do it. Some do not. Um, a okay. lot do not. A lot just only test IE2, FSH, and hidden B, vitamin gotcha. G, PSH. Um, okay. Some of those. But prolactin is so important. It's very, very wow. important because it could literally take you getting your prolactin levels down. And that mm -hmm. is what was the missing piece, you know, and that's what I saw in school very often is because some women either just had high prolactin levels or they had mm -hmm. a prolactinoma. Is that for men and women? Um, I've only seen it in women. Um, I don't really know how it would affect men, but I know um, when we saw it a lot, it was in young women and they present it with like a PCOS. Um, Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's something that, uh, that women with PCOS have higher risk factor for, or maybe is it the reverse and that it actually leads to PCOS? It, I don't know if, if they work together, but I do know it's very mm -hmm. common. Um, Interesting. Okay. And it kind of like falls in line, but this woman, we thought she had P PCOS, but she didn't have any of the other. Ah, okay. And so um, the doctor at the time, Dr. Roth, who's like brilliant. Um, she was, she was like, you know what? Let's test prolactin. And wow. she noticed it from her E2 FSH. The ratio was like way off and she had infertility and, and things like that. So, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Now, I mean, FSH, E2, these are day three labs that are super common. Mm -hmm. You know, easy. this is something that you can request, um, you know, your OBGYN to do. A lot of insurance carriers will cover those tests. Oh, absolutely. Um, in particular, um, you know, as you, in fact, I was looking at all of our insurance options re recently to make sure that at least fertility testing was covered. And it is. No. Nice. For our company, the cover benefit. So I wanted to make sure, um, you know, as we're, we we started to enroll in a new plan and if they don't cover it, there are at home tests that you can look up online, um, mm -hmm. you know, to try to do it at home as well and get a kit in uh, to look at that. I mean, as always, Fertility Tip Tuesday is about empowering our viewers, uh, empowering our community. Um, if you're concerned, if you already meet that definition of infertility where you're over 35 and you've been struggling to conceive for six months, um, if you're under 35, you've been struggling to conceive for 12 months, or you're in a same-sex relationship and in the absence of egg or sperm. I always feel like saying, duh, because I really don't like the definition of infertility because it <laughs> totally leaves out same-sex couples and doesn't make sense, um, which is frustrating. But what we want you to do is ask for these tests. Yes. Ask for a hormone panel if you're struggling. That's a good first step. You can always take a virtual consult with Dr. Raquel to review yeah. those results, set up a plan for moving forward that may or may not mean IVF. Um, but the first step starts with you and uh, and asking for what you need. Dr. Raquel, did we leave anything out? No, that was perfect. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much as always. And yeah. we'll see you guys next week. I think we'll do a deeper dive on prolactin. I love that. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Bye. Bye for now. Bye.